Well, over the course of this summer, as we have been uh, working our way through the Sermon on the Mount together, um, one of the things that has impressed me, and I, I'm not sure why this continues to surprise me, I don't think it should, but it, it, I was reminded again just how relevant or seemingly current the teachings of Jesus are in our own culture and in our own context. And we can look, and, and obviously historically, there's all sorts of, of cultural differences. There's, there's nuances in the text that, that applied then that, that aren't the way things operate now. And yet, as Jesus begins to lay out his paradigm for how, uh, uh, how we are to understand the kingdom of God, these values and these priorities that he's been setting out in front of us, and how they are different from the kingdom of the world that we experience and live in every day. And as he's been doing all of this, it began to occur to me that that, that which Jesus is showing us here, that which he's covering in this text, these are things that are common to mankind. That in seemingly any cultural context, any situation, any day and age, that Jesus is speaking to truths and experiences that we are all going to relate to and, and discover and have true in our own hearts and lives in various ways at various times. If you've been with us, we've been looking, we've been a part of a series entitled The Way of Blessing, focusing on the teachings of Jesus and the Sermon in the Mount and really discovering what does it look like when we live in light of the kingdom of God when we make his priorities our priorities, the things that he values our values. I was reminded once again of just how relevant Jesus' teachings are as I was preparing for this sermon. We're focusing today on, on the portion of the text where Jesus talks about do not be anxious. And as I was preparing for this sermon, Simultaneously to this, I was also preparing for my budget, monthly budget for the month of August. And I'm like laying out all the numbers and putting in all the categories and doing all that sort of stuff. And it's kind of got, you know, I get it all down there and I'm like, this is going to be workable. We can do this. And there's some margins here. And then, G and then uh, Sherry comes in and reminds me that um, the school fees are due, you know, and I was like, okay, we're, uh, we are never going out to eat. Um, you know, and that's a small thing. It's, it, I'm not, you know, I'm not like I'm looking at bankruptcy or all these, you know, it, it's a small thing. And yet, in that moment, the dichotomy of Jesus' instructions in this text of do not be anxious and the reality of what I was experiencing in that moment on a, on, on a small level, and, and they were like head to head, you know, and, and, and recognizing that that which Jesus is teaching us here remains extremely applicable to the world that we live in today. The reality is, according to a, a recent um, study by the American Psychological Association, is that three quarters of Americans experience symptoms related to stress in any given month. Half of us um, indicate that the, our stress is only increasing, and a third of us would say that we are living with extreme stress. So anxiety, worry, all of that is, it's extremely relevant. It's extremely pertinent in our culture. As a matter of fact, workplace spends over $300 billion every year in healthcare costs, miswork, and stress reduction treatments. And we're investing in this with issues like economic challenges or family stresses or workplace conflict or, or political strife or global terrorism or random violence and pretty much anything that we see on the evening news, it would seem that we have plenty to worry about. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us wish to live some sort of worry-free mindset and yet, according to the statistics, very few of us experience that. We find it almost kind of hard to believe. And, and if I'm honest, if I see somebody that, that really appears to kind of be one of those laissez-faire, worry-free sort of people, I have this mixed reaction of jealousy, like I wish I could do that, and judgment, where I'm like, they're not taking life seriously enough. You know, like they don't, they, they must not be, a part. like that, that's kind of what's going on in my heart. 
The reality is, is that most of us, our lives are filled with more worry than we know how to deal with. For many of us, our anxiousness can become paralyzing to the point where getting through the challenges of the day seems like a stretch, yet alone, let alone living with the sort of kingdom priorities that Jesus has been describing for us here. Today, we're going to explore the subject of worry through the lens of the Sermon on the Mount and through Jesus' description of the kingdom of God. And I think it's easy to approach this text, this is a bit of a disclaimer, I think it's easy to approach this text and feel frustrated because I, for one, wish that I worried less. I want to worry less. And yet, just merely reiterating that, that, that I need to or that we need to trust God more just for me seems to add guilt and defeat and, and uh, it, just, it, it piles on the anxiety that already can be crippling our lives. I think that Jesus is doing something more here. I think as we look at this text, as we enter this together, it's my hope and my prayer that the Holy Spirit would continue to reveal to us not only what the kingdom looks like, but also how we can live in it. Before we open up to Matthew 6, let me pray real quick. Father, open our eyes to your word. Open our hearts to receive, and may your Holy Spirit continue to to stretch and challenge us to be men and women who are more like you. It's your name I pray. Amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. This is where we're going to pick things up as we've been looking at the Sermon on the Mount together. We're going to start in verse 25 and read through, uh, through the end of the chapter here. This is... Matthew 6, 25, it says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life and what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body and what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, and yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I like the way the NIV reads that last part. It says, every day has enough trouble of its own. As we process this text together today, there are a few observations that I want to draw out. It really begins by understanding our struggle. By understanding our struggle, Jesus here puts some context to the nature of our anxiety or to the nature of our worry. Notice that this passage here, it begins with the, uh, with the word therefore. Jesus is linking what he's teaching us here in this section on the Sermon on the Mount with what he just previously taught regarding making God our only master. Furthermore, Jesus is drawing the connection between the root cause of worry and the world's sort of faulty value system. Throughout the course of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has been systematically now deconstructing our worldview. He's been deconstructing it in order to build in a new paradigm, a new way of thinking that's based on an entirely different set of values and based from the perspective of eternity. Jesus from the get-go in the Beatitudes has been establishing this, this reverse economy where, where both those who are hearing Jesus speak this for the very first time and us listening to it today have our value system essentially turned upside down. 
The struggle or the problem for us is that we continue to live in a material sort of system. Like our idea of security is, is based or obtained through the possessions that we are able to collect for ourselves or through the reputation or the opinions that we believe others hold to us. Think about this for a moment. When do we experience worry or what for us is at the root cause of it? When I boil so much of this down in my own life, in my own experience, it comes down to the point of these things that are either temporary, they're, they're passing, or they are ultimately beyond my control. Things that altogether seem important in the moment. I put so much time and energy into them. And yet when held up to the perspective of eternity, the perspective begins to change. In this passage, the word that we translate anxious is the Greek word marinamo. In one sense, this word is used in other places in the New Testament to, uh, to express sort of appropriate feelings of concern or care for another person. And concern is appropriate when it's directed towards the right things, when it's kept in proper bounds and when it aligns with the values and the priorities of the kingdom of God. Worry, however, is inappropriate when we, when we direct it at the wrong things or when it's in wrong proportion or it indicates a lack of trust in God. I think there's an example of this that, that helps me sort of wrap my head around this nature of this struggle, and that's between the experience of, of Mary and Martha when Jesus comes to visit them. If you flip over to Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, at the end of this chapter, Jesus arrives and he spends time with uh, uh, Mary and, and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus. And we're familiar with this experience, but let's listen to this once again. It says, now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. I love that last phrase. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. From her, and I find this experience between Martha and Mary so relatable. Because on the one hand, I want, I want to be like Mary. I want in my life and in a moment, I want to be able to sit at the feet of Jesus and, and to find my supply in Him. I want to be about His business and His priorities and operate according to His values. And yet, so often, I find myself in the place of Martha. Busy with all the wrong things, sometimes things that look so good and yet missing the opportunity to rest in the one who is both my provider and my master. Jesus says to Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. The Savior of the world is here in the room with you. Come be with him. He is the one who is capable to provide. He is the one who has the ability to meet your needs. Don't miss the time to rest in Jesus. I remember um, on one of the trips that, that we take students to Ecuador every year, and on one of the, the trips that we went, um, Rick Borman, who's one of our church-supported missionaries, was with us on this trip. He's actually gone the last several years, and he's just a great sort of uh, guide in all these. As a part of the experience, we take the students down into um, the depths of the jungle. And we do a hike through the jungle. And I always want to place myself really close to Rick because he grew up there. So he is able to explain what we're seeing and tell us about things that, that other people aren't able to do. And on one such occasion, I remember him um, pointing out the largest tree in the jungle. And he was like, do you see that tree? And, and all the students, myself, were like, yeah, what, didn't seem special other than the fact that it was, was huge. And he said, this isn't a tree at all. This is a vine. Um, it's called the strangler fig. And this will 
plant itself next to an existing tree, and over the course of years, it will grow up around that tree. And in time, it will eventually consume the entire tree to the point that that tree no longer exists. It dies and sign, and only the vine remains. And he says, this is exactly what sin does in our lives. And as I think about, and I was listening to the words of Jesus as it relates to this, to our anxiousness, our teenagers, how true of worry, how true of those things that I hold on to, that I cling to, thinking that I have control there. And Jesus is saying, this, this chokes the life out of you. You're no longer able to function and act according to your design purpose because we are claiming control of things that are outside of our control. Jesus points us back to the nature of our struggle. And He does so in order to release us, to offer us something better. Jesus shows us, shows us something of the solution, of our solution. He demonstrates now that resolution to this struggle that we experience is accomplished through trust, and trust is born out of surrender. Again, I, I, I want to be careful here because I, there is a danger, I feel, that to almost feel like to give easy answers to difficult things and just say, well, we need to trust God more. And, and perhaps that's true, but I think Jesus is offering something more there. I think he's, he's rooting the nature of our trust in God and our willingness and ability to surrender to him. As I mentioned earlier, this whole text that we read begins with the word therefore, returning to this question that he asked previously that confronts us is, is essentially who is our master? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6 now. Matthew chapter 6, in the verses just preceding this, uh, uh, 19 through 24, it says this. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart beat also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus here is is rooting our, our ability to let go of worry, to not be anxious, because ultimately saying, live as one where your treasures are in heaven. Live as those who have chosen God as your master, and as such, because these things are true, do not worry. I think Jesus here is modeling for us, he's teaching us about the nature of surrender. Surrender for me is an issue of control. Surrender for me is, is letting go of those things that are really already outside of my control, and yet I tend to cling to them as if, as if I am the one in control. Jesus is saying, let go of that in order to choose a loving God as your master. And he points out throughout the course of the text that this is not a blind surrender. Jesus points to the creation that is surrounding him as he is delivering He's preaching this sermon, and he said, Consider the birds of the air. Look, look at the lilies of the field. Consider the evidence that is all around you as to why it is reasonable to trust God and to surrender our control to him. Jesus points out that God is the one who is faithful. Jesus asked the rhetorical question in verse 25, Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Jesus is simply making the point that the one who gave us life and formed our bodies is faithful. He is the one who is able to care for that which we need, who is able to care for our lives and our bodies. He goes on to point out that, that uh, we can trust God because of our value. After asking us to consider the birds of the air and the way the Father cares for him, he asks the question, are you not much more valuable than they? 
Jesus reiterates now because of this creation, because that God has formed us, because we carry His image, there is an intrinsic value in each one of us. And that value affords us the care and the oversight of our Master. The third thing that Jesus points out here is one of provision. God proves Himself capable time and time again by by pointing out the lilies of the field as nature is growing all around them, that he supplies everything that is necessary for the beauty that they see, for the grass to grow and thrive. In the same manner, Jesus is pointing us to the Father who does all of this, and he does so with beauty and with splendor, and this is the very same God that can and does meet our own needs. This topic, this issue of provision was was brought home powerfully for me recently. As I was with students in Puerto Rico and we were attempting to replace a a home for a family in in dire need, Uh, to replace a roof, I should say. And so we began this project and the roof is entirely ripped off and as we're putting things back together, we came to a portion of the project where a roof coming in from one direction was, uh, was also meeting the roof coming in from the other direction. And some of you that have construction knowledge and backgrounds in that, you would have been really helpful in this moment. Um, but in that moment, I was the most seasoned um, worker. And, and I had done some things before, but nothing quite to this degree. And so on the one side, I knew because of the nature of what was happening, that this was going to involve a compound angle. There was, there was multiple angles, and we had to figure out what those were. And on the one side, I was able to do it. But as we brought it in from the back side of the building, I could not figure out how these rafters were supposed to be cut. And for hours, we worked on this, drawing things out, cutting uh, samples and tossing them off the roof and and trying everything. My friend Chris was looking up YouTube videos on how to cut compound angles, and we're calling people to try to figure out how to do this in failure after failure after failure, to the point of of giving up. This is probably hours now of attempting to accomplish this. And one of the translators there was a college student from Minnesota. And and the missionary who, who was hosting us always says, you know, when you don't know what to do, ATL, ask the Lord. Um, and so she came up and said, hey, why don't we, why don't we just ATL? Why don't, let's just go to God in prayer. And I thought, okay, you know, like you don't want to be the pastor who's like, that's pointless. Um, <laughs> even though that may, well. And so we just stopped and prayed. And I was frustrated. I don't know that my heart was in it. But I will tell you this. We are praying, and in my head, I can start to see the solution to cut these rafters. By the time we say amen, I look up and I say, I think I know how to do it. I think I know how to cut these. And on the first effort after that attempt, we cut the perfect angle for the perfect wrapper and laid it down and nailed it in. And it was like, yeah, we can clap for that. Thank you, Charlotte. That was (laughs) God working in spite of the lack of faith of a pastor. Um, But it was it was if God was saying, why didn't you trust me to provide? Like you, you tried every North American solution to a problem, including YouTube. And I had the answer all along. I had it for you and I was more than willing to give it to you. This is our God who provides. I think lastly here, and I want to move on um, um, quickly, but I think God pulls on their experiences of him. He says, um, so do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Um, or what shall we share, uh, wear? For the Gentiles run after all these things. And, and the Heavenly Father knows that you need these. He is pulling on Israel's rich history and their experiences of God. Where God has shown himself faithful. Where he's parted seas and he stopped flowing rivers. Where he has supplied manna in the morning and he made walls fall down. Where, where fire fell from the sky in order to consume an offering. And he's pointing them back to all of this. And he's saying that God, don't live as ones who haven't experienced this. Don't live as those who don't know this is true. He's pointing them back to all the times that they've experienced God 
as faithful and He does the same for us. For all the times He's answered a prayer in spite of our own lack of faith. For all the times that He has met a need that only He would have known that we have. I think sometimes the most powerful experiences of this in our lives is not in the grandiose things. It's not in the big things. I think it's sometimes when God speaks to the very specific, personal, intricate needs of your heart. Because only a God that knows you, only a God that had every resource at His demand, and only a God that loves you could do that. And Jesus is reminding us of all of this. He's reminding us what it means to surrender. Lastly then, as we move on, we see Jesus points out to consider our purpose. In light of all of this, He brings us back now to the fundamental message that Jesus has been proclaiming throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount. Look back at Matthew 6, verse 33 and 34. It says this, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now that Jesus has made His case here, He returns to the overriding theme of the Sermon on the Mount. And He gives us this directive. He says, seek first His kingdom. The imperative here that Jesus speaks to seek does not mean that we're looking for something that that is not present. Jesus has already announced now the arrival of the kingdom. Rather, He is reminding us as His disciples that we are to be the ones who make the kingdom the, 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 the center of our lives. The center of our daily priorities. This is the work of of Jesus in our lives to seek His righteousness, to be found in Him where we are intentionally and purposefully about the business of being made over into the image of Jesus. The work that He desires to accomplish. And as a result of all of this, this, all this whole section of of. Scripture about anxiety and worry concludes with this promise. The promise from Jesus says that all these things, all of these things will be added unto you. It's like worry about the right things. Worry about whether or not the kingdom is going forward. Worry about, about people as it relates to eternity. Worry about those things. I'll take care of the rest. I'll add all those things. I know, I know that this can sound trite and in in view of bills that are going unpaid or jobs that are insecure or relationships that are falling apart. But I don't know how else to say it. At the end of the day, He is pointing us back to Himself and saying, in me, in me is your supply. In me is enough. Be a part of my kingdom. Seek my righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Worry results in our everyday lives when we allow something in this world to supplant God as our master or our provider. I don't know if you think of it this way, but worry in an essence is a form of idolatry. Where we have placed something else as the one who is ultimately our king. When we turn to our own human efforts in an attempt to control our environment and the remedy according to Jesus, is to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, allowing God's strength to supply everything that we need for what is set before us today and trusting that He will do the same tomorrow. Would you pray with me? Father, we just thank You for this day. Lord, we thank You for Your Word and how it challenges, how it reminds us of of Your heart and the things that You care about. Lord, continue to root us there. Lord, continue to focus my eyes on the cross so that I will not lose vision of what matters most. Make me about the business of your kingdom. Do that for us as a church. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.